So we're going to start by looking at a rectangle in polar form. So when I draw a polar rectangle, uh, the best way to think about a rectangle, it's going to be uh, an interval cross with an interval. So I'm going to, so we're going to have some delta theta and some delta r. And we draw this rectangle. So there is a theta measurement right here. Now we measure our radius. There'll be some delta r amount. <clears throat> part I'm shading in is going to be a rectangle. So I like to think of this as pizza crust because pizza is delicious and you're looking at pizza crust. What I need to do is figure out the area. The area is not width times height. What is wrong if I multiply the angle and the radius the way they're measured here? What happens when delta r is really just a width right here? Does that width, if, if I move the width over to here, what happens to the area? Same width, but move it closer to the origin. You're eating the same thickness crust, but your pizza radius got smaller. Are you eating less crust? You certainly are. So the further, if you're, you have a big piece of pizza, your radius is big, you're going to eat more crust even if it's the same thickness. And so because of that, we can't just go with the product of those two. I also have to know how far from the origin are we. So our area of the kth segment so it's going to be delta r times delta theta times r And we're going to write it as r dr, or delta r delta theta. And once we take the limit to turn this from a sum into an integral, we're going to be looking at r dr d theta. And so the main difference between regular Cartesian coordinates and polar is you get the extra r. So I'm going to highlight it in green right here. So you get an extra R included in here, and that's super important. And that just comes from the fact that your polar rectangles, the further you are from the origin, the more area you're going to get with the same dr and d theta. So we have our, ready for, write down the volume. I'll just write it in with the limit and approaches infinity, summation, k equals 1 to n, our function of r and theta, so it would be rk theta k times r delta r delta theta. And when we take the limit, we're going to have a double integral. We're still over the region r. It's f of r comma theta times r dr d theta. And I'll be consistent and use green. That extra r jumps in right there.
So this is dA. R dr d theta is dA, which also has been dx dy or dy dx. We've seen that changing coordinates has a massive effect on the endpoints. We just went through a relatively complicated Cartesian example. Changing the endpoints from Cartesian to polars also has a very significant change to uh, our endpoints. So it's going to change them in a kind of different way. One will be a uh, minimum maximum angle, the other one's minimum maximum r. So they're going to be very different, so we're going to have to definitely pay attention to the endpoints when we change coordinates. Uh, you can still compute volume as an area if your height is 1. So that still works. So that's for volume. I'll write out the area, area of the region R. So it's double integral R. Now it's 1. Replace the function f by 1. Now it still has the R dr d theta. So even in the area computation, you still get the extra R in there because all that changes f was replaced by the function 1. So you still get that extra R in there. So what changes with our regions? So our regions, if you're using polar coordinates, they better be, I'll describe them as circular-ish. So they're not going to be circles. They may look like pizza crust, or they may look like uh, part of a circle, but they should have some type of circular uh, shape to them, or else you shouldn't be using polar coordinates. If you've got a square rectangle, you probably should not be using polar coordinates, uh, or you're going to have crazy endpoints that include weird sine, cosine functions, so don't mess with polar coordinates unless you see that your region has some type of circular uh, shape to it. So ready for some examples? So our region is going to be bounded by We're going to be outside r equals 1 plus cos theta and inside r equals 1. So we can combine these together. If we're inside r equals 1, what does that what inequality can I write to describe that? So here I have an equality easy to draw, unit circle, I want to be inside the unit circle. What inequality could describe all this? So r could be 1 or less than 1. So r less than or equal to 1. So that's what it means to be inside the circle. Your radius is less than that. Now, outside, what does that mean? Basically, it means the opposite inequality. Your radius needs to be bigger than what you're looking at. So we'll write it like this. Radius is greater than or equal to 1 plus cos theta. So here is our inequality, where r has to be between. So let's go back through some uh, graphing and polar coordinates. I just graphed the circle. That's easy to do. Let's focus on graphing this other shape right here. So when in doubt, you can use the Kluglis method. So if we go all the way back to pre-calculus, I would find symmetry and then use that to plot some points. So what symmetry are we going to have here? So 
So just looking at this cosine, if I replace theta with negative theta, cosine's even, I'll have that symmetry. So I can replace theta, swap out with negative theta. So if you don't remember what symmetry that is, so if you have r theta right here, there's theta. If I replace theta with negative theta, we're looking at a point down here. That means rotate the wrong way. So what axis is this symmetric with respect to? It's not going to be origin. We're not rotating halfway. We're going across the x-axis here. So we have x-axis symmetry. So what that means when I graph, if I graph the upper half, quadrant 1 and 2, I will flip it across the x-axis and get 3 and 4. So I'm graphing 1 and 2. Then we'll flip it down using symmetry, get 3 and 4 for free. I'm not going to put every theta value between 0 and pi. I'll just do the pi over 4 multiples. So 0, pi over 4, pi over 2, 3 pi over 4, and pi. So I'm going to skip all the pi over 6, pi over 3 multiples. If I wanted a more accurate graph, I would put all those points in as well. All right, 1 plus cos theta. So we'll just start with cosine theta. We have 1, 1 over square root 2, 0, negative 1 over square root 2, negative 1, and 1 plus cos theta. Now, 1 over square root 2 is approximately 0.71, I think. So we're going to add 1 to all these numbers, 2, 1.71. 1, now I have 1 minus 1 1.71, 0 0.29, and 1 minus 1 is 0. So we plot these points, plotting them as r and theta, so I have 2, 0, 1.71, pi over 4, 1, pi over 2, 0.29, three pi over four, and last up, zero, and pi. So we're gonna plot all five points. So polar graph paper, I don't have to go too crazy with angles because I didn't use that many angles. I'm only going to write out my pi over four, three pi over four lines like this. My biggest radius is two, so I'm making a bullseye once for radius 1 and once for radius 2. And then plot all these points. I'm going to use blue here. So I have 2 with an angle 0. Pi over 4, 1.71. Pi over 2, 1. 3 pi over 4, 0.29. And then 0. And always connect them the order you drew them and draw them in the order of increasing theta values so that you don't connect the wrong points together. You want to connect consecutive points with the curve. <clears throat> so we have this graph. There's x-axis symmetry, so we can flip this over. You don't have to be super accurate on the second part. Any questions on the graph here? So I did draw the radius 1 circle, which was the other curve. I just made it look like everything else in the graph. So I'm going to just go ahead and go over the unit circle in green here so that it looks different. So we want to be inside the unit circle, outside the blue. So 
So we get this shape right here. So I like to call this Batman's Boomerang. Isn't there some book, Goodnight Moon, where it looks like that? It's not required English 101 anymore? Okay. Isn't there like some moon drawn like that you've seen? I realize you'd have to have like two Earths or two suns to have a weird shadow like that. All right, so we need to get that area. How many places do they intersect? Two intersection points. You can see the angles right here. I don't want you to use the graph to find these intersections. Instead, use the inequality that we have and use algebra. So figure out the theta value to make these equal. So I want them to be equal. So where is 1 plus cos theta equal to 1? Where do we get equality? So that means cos theta equals 1 minus 1, which is 0. What solutions do we have for theta? Pi over 2. Is that the only angle? 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2. I can use negative pi over 2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's infinite solutions. We need to pick two consecutive that uh, have the correct inequality. So if we pick the wrong consecutive ones, we'll get the opposite inequality. If we pick the right consecutive ones, we'll get the inequality that we want. So let's look back at the graph. We won't answer off the graph, but we'll just look for which one should work. So I'm going to highlight one part of the unit circle. So what I highlight is from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Is that the correct part of the unit circle that we want to use? So that part is not on the boundary of the region. So let's highlight the other part of the unit circle. That part is a boundary of the region. So we need to go from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. What is wrong with going pi over 2 to negative pi over 2? What direction would I go to hit negative pi over 2? If I start at the top, I'd be going across the green path. You would pass by 0. You would be going this direction, pass by 0, and then hit negative pi over 2. That is not the part of the curve we want to use. We want to use the other part. So that means we're going to go pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. And then we'll be going the correct way around the curve over there. So any questions on the graph? So the graph can be tricky. Let's just use algebra instead. I'm just picking the easiest consecutive values I can. Uh, instead of going negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, I could do 3 pi over 2 to 5 pi over 2. That would be another option. That would be going the, choose the, positive, the smallest positive starting angle and then go to the next positive angle. I could also do, let's see, 7 to 9. There's a few other options, but... Let's do the easy one, maybe way easier to test. So I already know the first one's wrong from the graph. Let's see what it looks like in algebra. So when theta is in here, is this inequality actually occurring? So is 1 plus cos theta actually less than or equal to 1. 
Now, if I test pi over 2 and negative pi over 2, I get equality because that's where those numbers came from. So I'm not testing endpoints. I know it's already equal. I'm testing a non-endpoint. So what's the easiest angle in the interval to test? Zero. I could use pi over 6. There's a few other choices, but let's just go with zero. And I'm writing it as an open interval because testing the endpoints will get me nowhere. It'll get me it's equal to 1. So I'm choosing theta to equal 0. And then I have 1 plus cos 0, which is 1 plus 1. That's 2. And then 2 should be less than or equal to 1, except obviously 2 is not less than or equal to 1. So here we fail. Now normally I would say if that doesn't work, just go with the other one, but we're going to be careful and test a point in the other one. So any questions on why we failed? So I want you to pick an angle. What's the easiest angle to pick between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2? So I think pi is the easiest one. So do the same thing with pi as your angle theta. So we have pi, we get 1 plus cos pi, which is 1 plus negative 1, that's 0, and 0 is definitely less than 1. So we have the inequality going the correct direction. So algebraically, that's what it looks like to figure out which interval you should use. Just plug a point in, and then decide if your inequality is going the right direction or the wrong one. Generally, if you fail one, you're going to pass the other, unless I would just do both in case you get fail, fail, then obviously you're either your endpoints are messed up or somewhere in here your trig is, uh, has a mistake. All right, so I think we are ready to write this out. And we want to get the limits of integration. So let's go ahead and set up the double integral. I didn't say what function, so we'll just leave it as f r theta. It doesn't matter what function. I just want to write the bounds correctly. So we're using r dr d theta. So the inner bounds are those r's or thetas? So there's going to be r's. The way to see that is really just the order. So I'm just parenthesizing on purpose. We're doing our r integral first. So these are going to be r equals r equals. Now, I want to look at the original inequality here. Look at this. Little big, right there. That's your little function of theta. That's your big function of theta right there. You can go up a little further. I just want to warn you, these don't have inequalities attached to them. We had to turn the words into inequalities. So I strongly recommend you do that in a step. And then right here, I got little function of theta. So that's small function of theta and then big function of theta. So our small is 1 plus cos. And our big is 1. All right, any questions on those? So write in your theta values now, our outer bounds or thetas. That should be really clear. We wrote those down a couple times. So write down your theta values. So 
So that is the integral setup. You will generally not be reversing the order of integration. So I just want to warn you right now, you can reverse it with Cartesian coordinates, but reversing with polar is tricky. I recommend you don't do it. So you're always going to go R, dr, d theta. Uh, it kind of sounds like you're a pirate. We say R a lot, but dr comes before d theta, and don't forget about the original R that you get. All right, this is our first multiple uh, polar integral. So let's go ahead and compute this out. Uh, let's just get area because I didn't write down a function. So we'll just integrate the function one. So I'm going to find the area. So we're just going double integral pi over two to three pi over two, one plus cos theta to one. 1 r dr d theta. So we're doing our r antiderivative first. What is antiderivative of r? The r antiderivative of r. r squared over 2. Can I use symmetry at all? Let's look back at that graph. Sure can. I could. So radius, this won't affect the radius, but the angle. I can either go from pi over 2 to pi, do the upper half of the boomerang, or go from pi to 3 pi over 2, do the lower half. I always recommend do the positive one. So I'm going to do pi over 2 to pi, and then double it. So I think at this point, it's pretty straightforward how to finish the integral. There's only one part that's going to be a little tricky. How do you integrate cos squared? What identity do we use? So we're going to use our double angle or power reduction, depending on how you like to call it. So it's 1 half. Uh, 1 plus cos 2 times theta. So that's how you're going to integrate that last term. Everything else, that's just a number, and that antiderivative of negative cosine is regular sine. So the rest is all straightforward stuff. Actually, in that case, I should have canceled, canceled. I don't know why I didn't do that. And then we have everything looks a lot nicer. So one, cancel the one. Minus 2 cos theta minus cos squared theta. So one cancels the one. There we go.
All right, so when you're actually computing these antiderivatives, it doesn't matter that you're using R and theta anymore. It's just two different variables. So in terms of your calculus two brain, it doesn't matter. The only difference is how you set it up. So this is a good place to end.